going to talk about uh, re creating realistic friendships in writing. Uh, we're going to find out how our uh, esteemed writers on the panel have done that in their work, and then uh, we will see how the panel digresses from there. So uh, we're going to talk about, you know, Calvin and Hobbes, probably not, uh, Frodo and Sam, pretty sure we are, uh, and, you know, Godzilla and King Kong, because why not? Um, they have a really close relationship. And uh, we're just going to start out with, uh, not in movies, but in books. In books. We'll see who wants to take this first. Can you think of, like, this great relationship that you've read about? Do you want to introduce us? Yeah, as, as okay. we're going to do introductions, as you do that, and then tell us about your favorite, or one of your favorite, sort of, book relationships. Who wants to start with their introduction book and that question? Yeah. Like, Frodo and Sam, for example. Right. I'm just going to say that, so I took it. <laughs> How about, anyone want to jump in? Introduce yourself. And... Now, now <laughs> Dan, please start. No, no, let's start with Dan. Okay, all right. Do you want me? You want me to start first? Yeah, sure. You don't have to. That's <laughs> okay. Yes, you do. Start at the same time. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Allison Hymas. I, what, what do I, what should I say? Is, well, tell us what you write. Okay. Why are bit? you on this panel? I'm on this panel. I don't know. Oh, oh no! Don't <laughs> uh, no, I write. Uh, I write middle grade. I write um, fun sixth grade, uh, seventh grade papers um, with a kid and his friends who are a team of thieves and forgers and hackers. Awesome. And that is why you're on this. Panel. And that's why I'm on this panel. Um, we can't hear back here. Oh, okay. There's no mic. Okay. Well, yeah. You can hear me, Suzanne. I can hear okay. you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so if I give you the finger, it means speak louder. Okay. Oh, no. oh, this is the speak louder finger. <laughs> <laughs> we all have a definition. <laughs> Allison, what what's a good uh, like book relationship that you can think of that you enjoyed or liked? Or... Well, I got I well, okay. There's Frodo and Sam. I like them obviously, and um, I'm thinking a lot about the. Uh, is this working loud enough? Yeah, it's alright. Right, I'll try to. I'll try to use my big teacher voice. You want me to try to wrangle the mic? Uh, I don't yeah, think. I think if they had some, we'd, they'd already be in here. So if you can't hear, come. They brought sit one in the into front. the last panel in the last five minutes, so that was nice. Maybe they can bring us. Yeah, a mic. maybe they can if you want to go look. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. So yes, Al Allison. Um, the I, I like a lot of book friendships, but the ones that are coming to mind right now are the uh, the boys in the Case File 13 books by J. Scott Savage, and I like the friend relationships in the Lunar Chronicles by Marissa Meyer. Awesome. Shannon, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay, I'm going to try to be loud. Sorry, I'm not a very loud person. Because we're writers, we're not very loud people, we're like this. Um, <laughs> I'm Shannon Camp, and I write young adult and new adult in like every genre because I have ADD, so it's like dystopian and romance and paranormal and all that stuff. Um, and I also am a writer for SVG.com, which is a gaming website because I'm a mature adult woman who <laughs> plays video games a lot. <laughs> and um, I think, I don't know if this, I feel like this counts even though they're related, but I really love Sunny and Klaus and Violet in a series of unfortunate uh -huh. events because they just, you know, they work so well off each other. They all have their own little thing. Yeah. And I mean, I guess they have to be friends because they're no, they don't. Ones, right? They no. don't have to be friends. Exactly. I think most people yeah. in the room can agree you're not necessarily <laughs> friends know. with your Frozen relatives. Five book series is a reaction to the bickering siblings in like every other middle grade I had ever read. So there we go. Like, I, okay. You don't have to be I friends. I validated it's then. Better that is my favorite are. friendship. <laughs> Very friendship. That's awesome. Dan Wells, please introduce Hi. yourself. I'm Dan Wells. I am happy to be here. I write a little bit of everything, primarily horror and science fiction. The most recent one is a middle grade called Zero G that's basically Home Alone in Space. It is an Audible original right now, and so you can go listen to it on Audible, and it's got a full cast. It's like an audio drama. It's super awesome, and it's really cool. You've written um, a radio drama. I have. <laughs> um, I also do a podcast called Writing Excuses, and uh, it's great, and we're doing that here on Saturday, so come to that. Um, I am going to say, I'm actually going to go back to the Lord of the Rings, and I'm going to say Pippin Gandalf, <laughs> because they have a fantastic friendship that 
takes all three books to develop. They hate each other in the beginning, and they are super teary-eyed bros by the end of it. And it's wonderful to watch them build their friendship together. That's a good one. I was going to say Pippin and Mary, and then I'm like, no, they're kind of really rivals, but... <laughs> okay, so I'm Jessica Day George. I'm a best-selling author of 15 books. All of them are fantasy. Half of them are middle grade. Half of them are young adult. I did write a romance novel last year, available in an anthology. Very fun. Um, uh, and my... And, like I said, I, I wrote a series called, uh, the first book's called Tuesdays at the Castle, which is about a family that are all friends and get along like my family did, because if we didn't, mom would have killed us, um, <laughs> and their magic castle. But my favorite friendship that I'm going to talk about right now is, has anyone here read the story of Owen, Dragonslayer of Trondium? Thank you. Yes. Emily K. Johnson, E.K. Johnston, if you don't know her, fabulous author. She's the Ahsoka girl. She's the girl that wrote the Ahsoka tie-in book that just came out Sorry. last year and stuff like that. Yes, she's a wonderful human being. And her one of her big things is she loves to see friendships in books as opposed to just the romance as your only relationship. And the story of Owen is an alternate world alternate North America, where there are dragons, and so there are people raised up to be dragon slayers and dragon slayer families to, like, take care of the vermin type of situation. And Owen is a dragon slayer, and his family wants to make it more of a heroic calling. So they hire a band nerd from his high school to tutor him, because he's not doing well in school, but also to become his bard and compose poetry about Owen's killings. And they become besties, and it is amazing so there's a story of owen and then there is oh my gosh the fire fire watch the second one's called something there's prairie like fire prairie, yeah thank you yes prairie fire two book series wonderful love it that's awesome thank you so much we got a great panel group here um so i'm paul janess i've uh, sold about 20 short stories and novellas i've got four novels out i've edited about seven or eight anthologies uh, producer of uh, various rock operas you may have heard of, like the Star Wars one. Anyway, um, I'm just happy to be here. I'd like uh, Shannon and Allison to think about what you love, because Dan and Jessica just told us really what they loved, you know, about those two examples. So please think about, about what is it that you like? What's, who, who, Allison and Shannon, whoever wants to go first, what is it about the friendship in the books that you mentioned um, that you, you liked? That, what was it? Tell us more about that. I feel like kind of a cheater because... More than books, I like the relationships more in video games. <laughs> that's where I get. That's I okay, go like, for it. That's yeah, still a that's I know, still like, a, as an author. Why? Right. Right. Why? Why? How are they doing that that's making you love that? I think because, like, my books are very dialogue heavy. I really like the interaction between characters and, like, more so than the descriptions. I even wrote, I wrote a book about a gamer because I was like, okay, I want to, which you can find. It's called Pwned. Um, <laughs> but... I just, I love the dialogue and the interaction between characters, so I, I guess that's why I've liked video game friendships more than book ones, which is horrible to say as an author, but they're just, they're really well written. Can you give us an example? Um, has anyone played Oxenfree? Oh, explain it to like a non-video game player. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably a really bad one to do then. No, okay. So, because like how is, how is even, like when you say video game friendship, I don't know, like I'm picturing like a person on the screen and a person on the screen, how are they even, like what so is the, they what, have, how is there even a relationship? Especially like in Oxenfree, the whole thing is based on text. So, I mean, it's not, it, you know, there's people and you run around and do things, but it's all about how you respond to the people around you and that changes how they respond to you and it changes what the story does and where it goes. So it's like an interactive book almost. Like you have these other characters that you don't control and you get like three dialogue options on how to respond to them. And so depending on what you say, that changes the way they relate to you. And there's achievements for making everybody hate you by the end of the game <laughs> or by keeping certain friendships. And so that game is all about the relationships you're building with like ghosts and your dead brother and stuff like that. But, you know, like demonic you know, possession and things <laughs> like that. It's fine. Um, Typical. Though, but I man. love that. I love that it's like an interactive novel where you're, you're using your dialogue options to change your relationships. So it's like all based on relationships. So you like what you're talking about, though the examples that you held up just at the beginning, roughly, are is the old, good old show. Don't tell. You like it because you're seeing their actions and your and the dialogue, yeah. 
And that is showing you their friendship as opposed to describing that they were the very best of friends. Yeah, it's like okay. they don't have Prove to come it. right out and say it. Yeah. Prove it! Because they bicker, but, you know, unless you get the fire starter <laughs> achievement and make everyone hate you, like, you have some good friendships. I got that, by the way. <laughs> but I did play it, like, eight times, so in my defense. <laughs> Is that one Star Wars game you can play as a good guy or you can play like as a Sith? Yeah, My exactly. husband always goes through a good guy and then plays as a Sith. I know. Then he turned Boy. it over to our teenager who like, it broke him. He tried to play as a bad guy and he's like, I can't, I can't <laughs> kill those Ewoks! And I'm so <laughs> Of course you can't, you precious lamb! <laughs> 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 you are much less things to be in this world than somebody who can't play the bad guy. Yeah, right. so the whole time I got that achievement, I was like, oh, just do it, just click on the die block. Like, oh, it's fine. See, he's I telling me about his traumatic past, just say I don't care. I've, <laughs> I've never been able to play through a Star Wars game on the light side of the force. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> I try, I'm like, I'm gonna be good so this time. <laughs> no. And then you're like, serial killer in Star Wars. <laughs> there is a, there is a, a psychology dissertation involved in that that I hope someone has written, so I would like to read about it. <laughs> so, uh, besides hashtag, you know, kill the Ewoks, you precious lamb, um, <laughs> Shannon, what... <laughs> What do you think? What's the, the cool thing about the relationship in the book you mentioned? Say that book okay. again. Allison. Um, I mentioned, Allison. I mentioned I'm sorry, Shannon. I like the, 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 the boys in J. Scott Savage's Case File 13. It's yeah. a fun middle grade. And one thing I think I like about that is that these kids, um, they, make, they joke with each other, they banter, they'll tease each other, but when the rubber hits the road, they're always like, when the, when the big adventure happens, the monsters appear, they're always working together as a team even if it's not always perfect. I think that's why I also like the ones, the friendships in um, the Lunar Chronicles. Like specifically in my mind, I'm thinking of Cinder, I'm thinking of Cinder and Thorn in mm -hmm. the Lunar yeah. Chronicles. Anyone read those? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and one thing I like about that one is when the characters first meet, um, one of them is breaking out of prison, the other one is charmingly waiting for an opportunity to break out of prison. And they initially just don't entirely get along, but as time passes and they, interact with each other and you see them banter, you see them go through things together, you see them have experiences, by the end they they are this tight, the whole group becomes this big tight-knit group and um, they're really there for each other. I think I really like friendships where the characters, uh, even though they fight and they go through things at the end of the day, they really are there to help each other and not to tear each other down, not to... The banter is not mean-spirited. No, it's not mean-spirited. Like it's and that, You know, if they have nicknames for each other, it's not something that embarrasses or hurts that person. Oh, and, even, and that's what I have a hard time with. When yeah. They're supposed to be friends, and I'm like, my friend said that to me, I would never speak to her again. Mm -hmm. And even when they do have fights, and there are some, there's really pain and hurt there, and for, <coughs> because of what somebody did, um, they, they have this basis of friendship, they, they have reasons to try to break think through it, not just throw away the friendship because they had a bad day. And I like that. And that makes fighting so much worse among friends. If you really are true friends and then someone does something hurtful to you, that's ten times worse than if a random stranger called you a name or something like that. And you're like, what's your deal? Like, show them the other finger. <laughs> we're going to avoid questions for a little while. Um, so we're, we're going to just kind of go with the panelists right now. But save your question for later. So my, my uh, follow-up, and I'd like Jessica and Dan to maybe respond. Like, people have notebooks out there and pens, and they're writing stuff down. So what, like, two or three things mess up the whole creation of a realistic friendship in a short story or a novel. Like, can you think of some things that just, like, if you see it, you're like, oh my god, that was so dumb. Like, you mentioned it just now, just, if, if she said if that to me. they're perpetually mean to each other, like, and that's the basis of their friendship, like a mean girl type of thing, that doesn't, that doesn't fly. It doesn't fly for me. And <clears throat> I see a lot of people writing YA <clears throat> that... Are writing YA maybe because, oh, it's super popular right now and stuff like that. And they're picturing in their heads, like, the words mean girls and thinking, yeah, all teenage girls are like this. They all tear each other down. It doesn't mean they like that. It doesn't mean they're actual friends. Like, it's not a solid friendship if it's based on calling you, the one friend is always called a fat slut and the other, you know, and stuff like that. That is not a solid friendship. It's what people think is a solid friendship for teenage girls and they don't know. So, like, if it's based on meanness or, and you really don't have a handle on what that age group is like, you know, then, um, just walk away. But, like, <laughs> sorry, say No, you said it, you said it, again. like, what things do you read or see that just, it takes you it out of it. Work. Yeah, you said okay. it, yeah. Because I, I, like, I had an example. So, um, 
I never made it past like chapter two of the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants book. Um, because uh, I went to a very, and this is partially my personal experience, but I went to a very, very cliquish high school where I did in my senior year become extremely ostracized because I would in fact eat lunch with people not in my clique. And my clique abandoned me. And I was not accepted into other cliques because I played in the orchestra and therefore could not actually sit every lunch with the band kids type of thing. So the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants starts out telling you that these four girls are best friends even though they have nothing in common. And you're like, okay, so did they grow up together and now their interests have different? No, they did not grow up together. They just are best friends even though they have nothing in common. One of them is only interested in sports. One of them is a rich princess. One, is the, one of them is from a working class family and lives nowhere near the others. And I'm like, there is nothing geographically that says they would have become friends in high school. There is nothing like interest hobby-wise, class-wise that would have put them together. But they just keep repeating to convince you at the beginning, they are BFFs, even though they have nothing in common. And I'm like, that is not how you make friendships. There is something where you turn to someone you thought was a total nerd and you can't stand it. You go, oh my gosh, Dan, you knit too? <laughs> you know, there's always something, especially with younger characters. Either you grew up next door to each other and even though one of you is a football star and the other one sits all day in her room knitting, like, but you grew up next door to each other. You're the only two kids on the block. You had to play together. There has to be a reason why people become friends when they're younger that is not just because the same pair of pants fits them all. <laughs> so, in following up on that real quick, there, there are absolutely things you can do to force people together, right? You can put them in a crucible of some kind. If you've seen the, the reboot movies of 21 Jump Street, uh, yeah, it is, yeah. That, that's a fantastic friendship between those two characters who hated each other in high school, but then are forced to work together in police academy and end up becoming really good friends. They have nothing in common except for that experience that brought them together. And so yeah, you do need that kind of link at some point. Um, one thing that pulls me out of friendships uh, and I, it, is if they're really forced. Like if, and, and this kind of goes back to what she was saying, if you are telling me they're friends, but they don't actually feel like friends, there's no chemistry between them. Um, the example that's coming to mind is um, the Solo movie. Like, I never doubted that Han and Chewie were best friends until I saw the movie about how they became friends, which was so poorly done, and I didn't for a second believe that they actually liked each other because they were trying to force it so hard. Um, you know, just show them being nice to each other, and they never did. That's good. Do, do either of you want to weigh in on what pulls you out when, you know, when you're seeing, you know, Real friendships on the page, things that just annoy you. Um, I feel like I know. I know this should be obvious, but I see it a lot still. Um, is you need both of them to be real people. Like a lot of the time, you spend so much time on your main character, and then the friend is like a plot device. Like, oh, it's they a need to be here, not a friend. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I don't like that. Like, you should know. Well, at least for me, I feel like I should know the characters' like backstory, what they like. I need to know their inside jokes and like. Even if that stuff doesn't get put down on the page, if you know it, it's going to come through in their interactions. So I like to create like well-rounded characters for both of them. Even if the stuff that I am like thinking in my head, like oh they play D and D every Friday. If I don't put that in the book, that's okay because it's going to like affect how they talk to each other, basically. Allison? Um, yeah, I was actually going to say pretty much the same thing you did. <laughs> um, when one friend is subservient to the other. Like, always, like, the sidekick character where you have, um, like, you, I mean, you have your main character, and your main character is the one driving the plot, but when the friend only exists to build up the main character, only exists to make sacrifices for the main character, <coughs> only exists to further the main character's goals, and doesn't have any real goals, any real plans of their own, that doesn't feel real to me. That feels like a plot device. It feels like a sidekick, whereas in real friendships, your friends' goals, they have their own goals, they have their own plans, they have their own story, their own, they're the hero of their own story. And so when you have two friends in a book, the protagonist and, the, and or whoever they are, maybe they're both protagonists, I don't know. But they should both have, like, the friends should have these, their own ideas, their own plans, and sometimes 
the main character doesn't get that, but that's okay. But they support them anyway because and that's they what might Christ let them down by accident, accident because they're going off on their own roles. They're yeah. Kind of for the, but I have to do this. Yes, we know Frodo, you're very dramatic, but I yes. still have to finish trimming the verge. You know, like <laughs> so. Like sometimes they're not there for him by accident and stuff, and it it really adds to it. Yeah. Well, that's like I have um I have a book <coughs> that's a that's like a paranormal romance. It's called Parish. Um, but I had gotten some feedback from an editor that at the end, like, there's these four ghost hunters, and at the end of the story, like, the main character isn't the only one who saved the day. Like, all four of them had their part to play, and it was like they were all equal in how they, like, solved this mystery, and, um, they didn't like that, because they were like, no, the main character needs to be the one that is the person who does, like, everything, and they got it. Like, they are the ones that figured this mystery out. And I was like, but that's not how this friendship works, you know? Like, they're all equal partners in this, like they're all going to do part of it, so. That makes me think of a uh, series of fortunate events. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or like Ocean, Ocean. Ocean's Eleven. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. Ocean's Eleven, and he came up with the plan, but also Rusty worked on the plan. But if they had not had any one of those guys, it would not have come together. If they didn't have the Mormon brothers to go oh my start gosh. a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. So what, what Allison said uh, reminded me of what an editor taught me a long time ago, and that's like when you know two characters' storylines are coming together. Protagonist is is trying to do this, and whatever whoever is doing this, the story is right where they meet. You know when the two when they when the goals cross, you know, and they have counterproductive goals. That's the story. You know, so tell us that. And I, I, you were describing to me like like first and second drafts. You know, like mm -hmm. it's just convenient for me as a writer. To have them be friends, and for their friend to say, oh, but don't you want to go to the football game tonight? Like, you couldn't think of another way to do it, so you're just like, you know, you're just having them there to like, almost not info dump, maybe info dump, but to just like push the story there, I don't know, it's like, I don't, instead of, aren't you going to the football game tonight? Like you told me you were going to go. It's like, I don't, how about, how about, I don't want to go to the football game. No, right, I want to like go. A, no, I don't want to go. Like, like a badly written TV show, like, oh, but remember last time, like an episode ago, when this happened, Archie? <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm not saying this without right. Riverdale. <laughs> I think in a lot of ways, writing a friendship is like writing a romance, right? Both people need to be getting something out of it, or you don't believe it. Um, if I don't fall in love at some level with the characters in the romance, I'm not going to believe that they love each other. If I don't like the characters, if I don't like Legolas and Gimli, I'm not going to believe that they like each other either. And so I, I need to see that they are both benefited by this. Um, in Mexico, where I used to live, they have a, a phrase that when you meet your soulmate, they call it the half orange. That is the other half of your orange. And so you complete each other. And that's a romantic metaphor, but I that's think it applies to friendships where as the well. Term platonic comes from. Plato believed that souls were halved when they were mm -hmm. born, and you're always looking for the other half of your soul. There you go. And that's what platonic means. <laughs> and and I think that, that that applies to friendships just as much. Like this other person gives me something that I need emotionally or whatever, and I give them something that they need emotionally, and that is what makes us friends. We like being around each other, we support each other, we help each other, we make each other better. And that's usually when you see a bad friendship, and when it's highlighted as a bad friendship, is the one person is a giver and the other is a taker, and it's just everything, and it happens a lot like in, in young adult books where you slowly come to realize that the the main girl or whatever, like all she does is take. The other person gives up, oh, take my prom dress, it's prettier than yours and stuff like that. And you look so much better in it. And they just like give everything to this person until they're emotionally and spiritually exhausted. And that is a bad one-sided friendship, but it happens so often, I swear, in fantasy because we're all thinking we've got our hero and that we've got our, our hobbits carrying packs, you know, and, and they're not all real characters, and so yeah, you don't buy that friendship yeah. when they're just like one of the worst like, friendships. Just there to provide weapons, like the new, um, the new, um, what is it, Jumanji, the new Jumanji when Kevin oh, yeah. Hart's like He's his like, his the entire backpack. character, <laughs> character is that he carries the backpack <laughs> for the rock. You know, that's his entire character. Um, I was gonna say that one of the worst friendships in all literature is the Giving Tree. Oh, oh, oh painful. Oh, so horrible. 
And I'm sure there's at least someone in this audience who's like, I love that book. I can't wait to name a baby shower. It's dumb in your No. Have you guys seen Bates Motel? Because that's what Norma Bates says parenthood is. She's like, I'm the giving tree and all that's left is a stump. And then your children take everything from you. And they sit on your face. Oh, yeah. No, and it happens so often. It happens so often in books because they're the hero and the, the other person is the, or, and even like, and even worse, the token ethnic person. Yes. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. I'm just here to carry your backpack sassy because I'm sassy black best friend. Sassy black best friend. Sassy like, oh, wait, friend. we need diversity. <laughs> there we go. Like, yeah. Throw somebody in there. <laughs> By the way, if you also hate the giving tree, go to YouTube and look up sassy gay friend, the giving tree. You're welcome. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> there, is an, uh, there is a YouTube series where sassy gay friend comes in. Wait, stop. What are we doing? What, what, what are you doing? And like fixes all these tragic love stories, but he does the giving tree. And he's just like, so he's just gonna come and sit on your face? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> The Romeo and Juliet one is. The Romeo and Juliet one. But also, also Desdemona. <laughs> My lord Otello, first of all, stop saying Otello, it's affected. And <laughs> Anyway, sorry. Yes, I guess Paul. the takeaway from that is that a good yeah. friend is somebody to come in and tell you when you're being silly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. So, um, in your own in your own um, stories and books, can you think of any little little things that you did to try, you know, like co you know, consciously, like I have to make this more realistic? Can you think of anything that you did, or just <coughs> things that you did, Dan? Yeah. Yeah. So. My uh, cyberpunk series, uh, starting with Blue Screen, yeah. that is all about a group of girls who are friends. I mean, that's oh. the core of the, of the whole thing. And the friendships were not working in the first draft of it. And I realized one of the problems I had was what we've been talking about, where it was a main character and a bunch of sidekicks. They were not equals. And the solution to that was that I made a different one, the the queen bee of the of the group. Like it, so, instead of the main character being the kind of the head of Wait, the really? of the team, yeah. Did it not come across that way? <laughs> no, no, no. So she was a later addition. Like was she there at all? Yeah, she was there, but she was Marisa was like the yeah. the, the queen bee in the first draft, and it, it just came no. across as that's this, not her personality. No, it's not her. Yeah, I, I had to change everything. I'm so, so glad that it you fit. did. Yeah. <laughs> it worked. It worked. If you have not read his Mirador novels, they are so much fun. But have you read them? Oh my gosh, they're all. Well, don't ask me that right in front of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm leaving. <laughs> no, it's, it's a group of teenage should... girls that have a, an esports team. I should probably throw out there that I do the run a newsletter <laughs> called Jessica Recommends because my whole joy in life is recommending books to people. You would love the Mirror Girl Series. They are girl video gamers. You what would love it. What the heck? It. Why have I not read this? <laughs> this is my book. You should all read it. Yes, <laughs> and we should. And it is. It's, it's the friendships and realistic portrayals of teenage girls go oh, down. So I mean, much. it's like you have. I don't know, a teenage It's like I have a something. teenage daughter in the room. <laughs> Dan's really a teenage girl, we all know that. Just don't let the beard fool you. This takes six the, hours. The unplanned part of that series, I did not set out making that book, of, the, the trilogy ended up being about the teenage girl's relationship with her father. That was not on purpose. That's just because I have a teenage girl and, and we father. fight all the time. So I'm like, I'm putting this in the book now. <laughs> So you take life. Do your homework. <laughs> you take life and you put it in the book, and that's how you create a realistic friendship. Okay. Good. Well, that I mean, that's that's what I did with um, the the Castle series. Um, uh, my uh, Tuesdays of the Castle series. I was seeing so much um, of the middle grade series where the again, kind of like Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. You got the twins that one is super dark haired and really tiny for their age and like only like sports and then the other one is tall and blonde and blue eyed and only does this and I'm like really they're twins <laughs> anyway um <laughs> and they fight all the time and in my family that was not cool we were not allowed to do that if you had an argument still to this day when I was 40 years old my mom made me and my 43 year old brother sit down in a room alone and talk it out <laughs> and then hug it out it was very awkward. <laughs> but, okay. <laughs> but, but so I based the family in my books on on this family. They've got the oldest is the sister, the two brothers, and then the youngest sister, and that's me. 
and she's running around her magic castle, which we sadly did not have growing up, but the dynamic of the siblings is the way we talk to each other, and the way we used to joke about my sister spending so many hours in the bathroom doing her hair and stuff, and, and but, but she is very smart, so maybe the hair is hiding a big brain, you know, and so, like, the things we used to say to each other, and I tried to put that, use, it, use your real relationships, put them into a book. So Shannon, in your in like, give us the title of one of your books and some things you did in there to create realistic uh, friendships. All right. First of all, if you want some really good storytelling with good friendships, Alex Hirsch, the creator of Gravity yes. Falls. Oh, the the yes. one thing that he said going in, he said the only rule I have about this show is that the the twin siblings are friends. Like they can argue sometimes, but it's never mean spirited. Like they are always going to be friends. So you guys should watch Gravity Falls. That's what you I should. I love that show. Um, <laughs> The so, Halloween episode. Oh my goodness, it's so <laughs> My baby was Bill Cipher for Halloween. Anyways, <laughs> um, yes, so, oh, oh, thank you. Sorry. I don't know if you All right, uh, next clip down is a uh, mute, by the way. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Better? <laughs> okay. Still, still talking. Oh no, loud. still be loud? Is that yeah, good? Yeah, or is that like good. blowing out your ears? Okay. Oh, um, so my book, Parish, which is my paranormal, like, I guess, paranormal romance, because there is romance in it, but it's about this group of four ghost hunters, and, oh, look at that. Eat the okay. money, people. Uh -huh. um, and, I mean, I kind of already said this, but the thing I do to make realistic friendships, and you can do, like, I think, maybe, uh, maybe not, but if you don't have these kinds of friendships in your life, so you're like, well, how am I supposed to pull from experience? Because I don't have any friends. <laughs> Gamers. Aww. Um, Give her an all. Aww. I have my yeah, online she's a gamer, friends. so everyone hit F. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Um, so I think that what you can do, and what I like to do, is my book Parish is told, it's in first person, so it's only told from Sadie's point of view. But there's the three other people in the group, and I've written short stories from their points of view that I have never published. I haven't put them anywhere. They're just for me. And that way, I, I flesh them out. They're real people. Like, I know how they interact. I know I, like, write some of their backstories together, like, as friends and growing up and things like that. Um, which I know that's extra work and that's more writing, but it really comes through in the writing because they, I know exactly how they would react to each other in any given situation. It's like a sitcom. You, it's a situational comedy. You take people, you put them in a different situation, and you figure out how they would react in that situation. And then that kind of helps you flesh them out and makes it so that their friendship is realistic. Brilliant. Allison. Okay. Um, okay. Hi. Um, making sure this works. Um, so in my books, I've got my main character is a thief in middle school, and um, he's got two friends, one of which is a forger and one is a hacker, and they get into shenanigans together. That's basically, like, that's what's going on. And in my first draft, I did kind of have the situation where my main character was the, the king of his group, the king of the school, and these friends were just kind of there to be comic relief. Um, but I, how many of you have heard the, the quote about how the villain's always the hero of his own story? Yeah. Yeah, I try to apply that. What I decided to try to apply that to the to the best friends, to the main, to the friends. And I sat there and I wrote, I rewrote little, a little summary of the story from the perspective of these friends. Like, what, what is their story? What is what story do they think they're part of? Um, and although the the novel itself ended up being my main character's story, um, I understood what was going on in case the forger's head. head. Um, I understood what he, how he saw the story was going going down. So whereas my main character's got the situation where he is in way over his head and has to team up with his nemesis to save the school, his friend's story is about uh, him seeing his best friend, my main character, slip and fall and start lying to the people he thought were his best, that were his best friends. So but this, side, this friend character, who was, who was not the main character of the story, had his own, his own arc, his own story. And even though that wasn't referenced, that was something that I knew as I wrote the book, so I was able to write the real, write the interactions between the two characters, not like a protagonist and a side character, but as two protagonists who had this conflict. And that really worked out well, and that helped in the, the next book um, when the conflict just deepens. That's great. We're at like 10.33, uh, and we're going to do questions now. 
Also, um, the rest oh. of us just live here. Have you guys heard of that book? Oh, no, yeah. go ahead. Please continue. That's a good one for this, what we're talking about, because it's about side characters. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's told from point of view of side characters. So they're like, oh, remember when all the main characters were, like, beautifully dying of this disease? Like, referencing, like, the folk There's been, like, a plague of vampires. <laughs> yeah, them. exactly. Or, like, the other kids at the high they're, school. Everybody else at like, the high school that the book is not about. And it's called The yeah. Rest of Us Just Live Here. So there you go. All right. That's what I want to say. Awesome. So remember, I, I like you, often used to sit out there more than up here, and I would want to make comments uh, at panels. And in general, they were brilliant. But, uh, but we really want to do questions. So let's questions. do questions. Questions start with question words. So right in the back, stand up and ask your question. Um, I wrote it down, so sorry. Speak uh, loud. Question for Jessica, or anyone else who wants to answer it. Uh, you mentioned the giver and taker friendship as being portrayed as a positive thing, but is there a way to portray this realistically in fiction? The giver and the taker? The giver and the taker. Yeah. As sure. a positive thing? Like, if you want, you no, want you to. No, you mentioned portraying it, you know, as this unhealthy relationship as a positive thing, but is there a way to portray it realistically, you know, as, as it is? Um, as, as a negative thing, as an No, I did not say it was a positive thing. No, I know. Oh. <laughs> how, do you, how, do you know? how do you make yeah. it as a positive thing? No, sorry. No. Okay. How do you do it realistically? How do you do that realistically? So you can see it, it as, as you see it a lot as how do you people make it trying like that? Right? Oh, people are trying and yes. claiming it's a positive yes. thing and yes. it's not a positive thing. <laughs> I think it realistically to make sure that it is, it is well known that it is not a good thing. There is an excellent book by a friend of mine um, called Not in the Script by Amy Finnegan. And um, the main character is basically a star on like a CW type of show. And her best friend is another girl who used to go to the same auditions as she did but never got her big break. And it's very much a give and take a relationship, probably not in the way you're thinking. And she goes very, very over the top in order to show how this girl is bringing her, the other character, down. Um, it goes from like, let me borrow your really expensive Gucci dress that was given to you and you can wear this old dress of mine, to let me take this boy that I know you've been in love with because you owe me, because I'm not as famous. Like, the person just takes and takes from her and you can see the other person becoming more upset and exhausted. But you really have to go like over the top to where you're questioning the sanity of the giver. Like, why would she do this for her? Well, it's her only friend. It's the only person that she can trust that she's been around since before she was famous. So she feels like, this is my only friend. If I don't give in to her and she doesn't like me anymore, she will go away. I will have no friends. It is not in the script is the title of the book. And it's an excellent capsule of what that give or take a relationship looks like. Thank you. Thank you. I, I also want to mention just the movie Mean Girls. Yes. Regina does this. I mean, it's such an obvious thing to pull out, but Regina has her two sidekicks. They yeah. think that she is their friend, but no. And it's very clear in the movie. Just It doesn't make a big deal of it, but she is always, anytime they step out of line, she slaps them down. Uh, she is the one who calls all the shots, and you can tell where all the power is, and eventually they rebel. Next question, right there. Okay. So I think a lot of like friendship you validate through dialogue and so my question is when you're writing dialogue and you feel like it doesn't seem like a natural conversation what is your like remedy? How Can someone repeat that? the question and handle this one? Um, her question is when you're writing dialogue and it doesn't feel natural how do you how do you make it feel natural? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Anyone want to grab this? Okay, hand it over. Do it. All right. Yeah. Um, Dialogue is a big way in how I, in, I show interactions with my characters. I am I love snarky, snarky, snarky characters, and so that's, that comes out a lot. Um, yeah, well, my first drafts I typically have that they don't. It doesn't feel real. It feels like the dialogue exists to further the plot. What I'll do is I'll go back through and I'll um, familiarize with myself with the characters, how they speak, the things they're interested in, um, which characters are the ones who are more like just sarcastic, and which ones are a little bit more straightly funny more of a dry wit versus an over-the-top one. Um, I write a lot of a lot of jokes in mine. Um, How many jokes per paragraph? Uh, <laughs> depends on who's talking. Um, I'm not judging you, what, I that's am. That's what she's talking about, though. Some of the yeah. characters probably it's all going to be a joke, and some of them not. Yeah, and um, so when I try to make the, the conversation feel realistic, I'll... I'll map out the plot points, the things that have to be said in order to move things along, 
but I've come to realize that people don't always say the things that they're feeling. And so I will look at those moments where it feels stilted and almost 90% of the time it's because somebody's saying something on the nose that is exactly what I, the writer, need them to be saying, but that's not how people talk. People will dance around the issue where they'll pick, they'll be so mad that you left your shoes on the ground but uh, in, the, in the living room, but that's not the issue, it's something else. And so I'll try to figure out what's the actual issue here, what would they say instead of exactly what the issue is, and how would this character say it? Would they say it in a funny way? Would they be angry about it? Would they be sad? Would they be passive? And that usually fixes the problem for me. That, that usually makes it more realistic because then I can see what they're willing, what, and oh yeah, and then also what they're willing to talk about with their friends. If they're willing to be more on the nose or if they don't feel comfortable talking about that. It says something about the friendship. Yeah. Anyway, that's how I handle it. Great advice. Uh, next, okay, right there. Stand up and ask your question. Yeah. So, Jessica, you gave a great example of your family and how your mom was kind of the source of that friendship. I'm wondering if some of the rest of you would be willing to think about some of your close friendships and give us what you think of as the wellspring of that friendship. Like Jimmy and Scouts. I'm like Shannon. I have no realistic relationships. <laughs> John's been up to <laughs> Um, I can create realistic who, friendships who, okay. on the Okay, his question was, uh, <laughs> similar to Jessica saying that her, you know, her, mom, her mom was there friends. kind of forcing everyone to be friends. <laughs> he wants the rest of us to talk about where our friendships come from. Love is the answer, yeah. babies. Come on now, right? Like, you love, you love them. If you don't, I don't know who you are. I mean, are you human? My, my husband and I, our relationship is based on movie quotes, so... <laughs> I mean, he doesn't play video games, he likes sports, like, we are not the same person, but we love movies, man. And we only speak in movie quotes, so that's how I build realistic friendships. You can quote movies to me. That's I'll awesome. marry you. <laughs> um, I, 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 you asked this question, I thought about a friend that I had since my freshman year of college, we were actually, we were just placed in the same apartment together, the same dorm together, and she is just, um, I just admire the heck out of this girl. She is the nicest, sweetest person, person, and I wish that I could be her, and for some reason she thinks that I'm a good person too, I guess, um, but I guess the, the wellspring is that we, we were put together, we were living together, and we, uh, so that's how we got to know each other, and then we both learned that we really love Disney movies, and from that point on, we're like best movies. friends at forever. Yeah, movies. Bringing people together. <laughs> movies. Okay, I have a list. I have a quick list. Let's do another question. So what, what, what brings people together? Shared trauma, love, chemistry, personality, geography, necessity, and Disney movies. Yes. Okay, <laughs> next question right there. Um, do you have any advice of friends growing apart, like they're growing up and moving out of way from each other? Mm -hmm. Like how know. would how would that happen? Like they start out as best friends, then like through growing up, they're growing apart in different directions. Like what's the best way to handle that? How to handle the depiction of friends growing apart? I don't know. That's sad. <laughs> Why do you want me to do that? <laughs> Okay. Um, I have a book, um, it's not out, it's finished, but it's not out, it's called Erasing Emily, and it's from the point of view of this boy who grew up next door to this girl, and they were best friends all growing up, and then she got hot over the summer and was like, bye. She got what? She got hot over the summer, like, look oh. at me, I dyed my hair and I got really cute and I don't need you anymore, mm -hmm. and so the whole thing is about them growing apart without him realizing they're growing apart, because she becomes a taker, and he's still a giver, like, no, we, I can, you know, take you places, I can be here for you when you need me, but you're not there for me. Um, mm -hmm. So I think changing the dynamic in the relationship and being able to show, like, why they're growing apart, maybe, and... I and think it can it's, be sudden, like, it can be sudden, like, yeah. like, well, we're moving and I need to make new friends, so goodbye. Yeah, exactly. Or it can be slow, like, I just realized that she has not returned any of my texts in, like, a week. Yeah. Like, so. Exactly, and, like, maybe, I don't know, I think, I like it more when the main character doesn't realize, maybe, that they're growing apart at first. It takes them longer than it takes the reader, and they're like, why are you doing this? And they can finally come to that, like, realization. Awesome. We're, we're, at, we're almost out of time, so what we're going to do is not take any more questions, but maybe people will answer your questions in the hallway afterward. We can talk about it later if they have time. So we have about two minutes left. I would love for the panelists to you know, give a final thought and then let the crowd know like, where they can find you, maybe at a table or an event or something like that. You know, say, you know, say, say something about where they can find you later and your final thought. Who wants to start? 
Yes, I've got the mic, so I, I got the mic. I guess I'm starting. Um, uh, final thought on friendship, I, writing realistic friendships. Um, people are people. People are real people, and so when you write a friend, they, they should you should give the same attention to writing a real person as you would to writing another character. Maybe not to the same extent as your main character, but has... Nobody's got time for that. Nobody's got time for that. <laughs> but knowing their thoughts, their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations, their fears, knowing some things like that can help make a more realistic character. Um, as for You Can Find Me, I've got another panel later this afternoon and a couple tomorrow, and I will be at the book signing event on Friday night. Thank you, Shannon. Um, okay, my final thought quickly is just make sure they're both real people, kind of like what you said, because that helps you know how to interact. Um, I'll be on other panels. I might be at the Future House Publishing booth at some point, um, but you can also find me on Twitch and YouTube under Persephone Plasmids. Awesome. I'm an adult. Persephone yes. Plasmids? Plasmids like from Bioshock. Dan? Yeah! <laughs> I am Dan Wells, and um, I am leaving this panel to immediately run to the Bryce room to do a panel about ensemble casts, which might be the same panel that we just did. Um, <laughs> after which, in the same room, I'm doing eSports. So if you are into video games, and come and listen to us talk about eSports. Cool. Jessica. All right. Uh, I have a newsletter you can sign up for either on my Facebook page or on my website, which is jessicadayofgeorge.com, called Jessica Recommends, where I recommend books on a theme every month. And I will be on, like, every panel ever for the next three days and at the signing. And if you come to my reading on Saturday at noon, I'm giving away two of my books and will possibly read something that will shock and amaze you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm Paul Janess. And uh, noon tomorrow, I've got a performance. It's a reading with Michael Brent Collings. And we're going to perform some uh, from the Sakura novel. And then on, on Friday night, we're going to have pizza at the launch party, and heavy metal, and there will be a mosh pit, and you should come. And thank you all for coming to Creating Realistic Friendships. Have a great convention. We'll see you later.